Y'all fire away. Sam, or excuse me, Trey. I'm sorry. Ah, Sam, 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 first faux pas of the year. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, they're, they're both similar. Mac was just saying they're similar about the competitiveness and stuff and picking over mistakes. Drake was doing that with us after the game Saturday night where people are asking questions about setting a record with five touchdowns in a first debut. He's going to miss passes. So when you met with him yesterday, went over the film, how was that experience and go, for him going over the things that he missed as opposed to the, all the things that he didn't miss? So I would say that uh, Drake's personality and Jacoby's kind of the same way. That those, those two are uh, they're really, really humble. And they don't, uh, with regards to Drake, I would say Drake almost, and I, I don't know this, not like we talked about it, but just the way he handles it, Drake almost, uh, it's almost like a superstition or it's a, it's, a, it's a bad omen to talk about the good stuff. You know, he always wants to, okay, the touchdowns are fine, the good passes are fine, but he, you know, he immediately, uh, upon getting a compliment, it's like, yeah, but you know what, I gotta work on it. And I have said to him on a number of occasions, I said, look, appreciate when you do something well because he does execute a lot of things well, but he is a perfectionist, uh, which is a good trait to have as a quarterback. Uh, and he's forever looking at um, what he's not doing well. He's forever asking about what he's not getting done the right way. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's what you need to do if you're trying to get better every day. So I think he enjoyed playing well during the times of the game that he played well, and I think uh, he was very, very receptive. Because Sunday meetings tend to be with coaches. They tend to be, hey, you look at all the positive stuff in, in a blink. Like, that's good, that's what we're supposed to do. And we're really, you know, you're making a snap tape most of the time and you're looking at all the negative stuff. Or you're looking at the stuff that you can do better. And that's really what he wants to see. So we kind of move on from the positive after a few comments and then we look at a few things and we, we hit the stuff that we've got to get better at that we need to do better for next week. Um, some of the mistakes we made on Saturday, if we make them again at App State, they're going to be bigger mistakes. And so what we need to do is make sure we take the field, having all that stuff rectified. And so the perfectionist approach that he has is, is, is really good, especially with a young quarterback that needs to develop from week to week. Max, was pleasantly surprised that Drake played as well as he did on Saturday. Was there anything that you were surprised about other than just the way that he went out there and, and dominated the way that he did? So, you know, I, I think uh, Drake like Jacoby and, and have a different advantage maybe than Sam Howell did. They, they've been out in this field before. You know, our, our, our blue team, our white team, they get the same amount of reps every single day in practice. So Jacoby and Drake and even Connor in the spring shared everything. So they got reps in it all. And then, you know, Drake and Jacoby got equal reps all the way through August camp. So these guys have been here for multiple years and they have seen corner blitz, they've seen double back of pressure, they've seen safety pressure, they've seen uh, all of the different looks from a front of coverage and a pressure standpoint. So uh, it was just nice to see Drake put the whole product together. You know, and, and he's, he's got a good number of plays. I'd say we played 78 snaps. I think Jacoby got eight and, and uh, Drake might have had about 70 or 71 snaps. And I said 55 of them we really liked and there might have been a dozen or 15 plays out there that we'd like to have back and handle differently. You know, there were some things where we had the deep shot open and he took the check down. So there was a positive on the play, but it could have been an explosive, those types of things. Um, and, and, and really the biggest thing is we wanted to settle his feet in the, in, the, in the pocket. He was way too active with his feet, he knows that. And so we need to kind of stay at the top of the drop unless we really have to get out of there. And that, that'll be an emphasis for, for he and I this week. Not to give, obviously, your offense and play calling away, but what have you changed to adapt to what Drake does well or, or what you want him to, to do well and utilize? I know the red zone looked a little different at times. Maybe how you move him is, is maybe potentially different than Sam. So I have alluded to this a number of times, but I, I have always felt, even going back to watching him live in playoff games in high school, that he never gets the credit for the mobility that he has. You know, and, and, uh, and I heard Coach Brown talking about him in summer workouts beating some of the other school players on a lot of our COD stuff and our speed stuff and our explosion stuff. So he, he, he's quick. You saw, you saw that when he, when he took the burst down the right sideline off the draw. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's a much bigger running threat than people give him credit for. You saw that on Saturday. 
Um, I also think his mobility helps him extend plays. So uh, we move him a little more. If you, you know, if you've noticed that already. We will roll him out. We'll, we'll use him on the edge. Um, we will use him in the run game when we feel like it's an effective, you know, attack. Um, but we, we want him to do what he did Saturday. We want him to distribute the ball to the talent that we have and use his legs, you know, as as an add-on. You know, I mean, at the end of a play that doesn't work the way it's supposed to schematically use his legs. And then when we want to call his number, you know, as the ball carrier in the draw or off his own read or something, then we can because he has the ability to do it. And then one of the other things that both of these guys do really well is I've always felt like Drake and Jacoby do a fantastic job uh, throwing off platform. And so, you know, on the run and, and off a different uh, in better, have different scenarios where their body is not set, their feet aren't set, they can't throw. The touchdown throw to Gavin Blackwell is a perfect example, right? Probably stepped up in the pocket and moved around too much there, we could have just sat there. And I think he had a return route to Josh Downs that was open. We could have, we could have hung right there in the pocket and fired that and scored. Um, he didn't see it. We're kind of moving around a little bit. He dances out, we scramble left. That same concept opened up as a scramble route to Gavin, and he threw off platform there. You know, it was a nice throw, and it, and it was a score for us. So that's a perfect example of a, a play that resulted in a touchdown that we probably could have made a little bit easier. And then it also demonstrated his athletic ability. You know, so that's that's going to be an asset all year. Any, any difference in approach to the red zone or high red zone in terms of the jo uh, jump yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, uh, you know, Sam was mobile, but Sam was uh, more of a. I, I kind of in my mind saw Sam as a more physical downhill north-south runner. We used him in that way. Zone reads, we wanted to turn the corner quick and get vertical. I think what uh, Drake gives you, he's not going to be as you know, physically as strong heading north and south. We want him to slide more and do those type of things. But he's really good laterally, and so you can do some more of those things. He can, he can roll out, he can run naked. You know, he can, he can uh, be mobile laterally, and you know, it's just one of his strengths so we're going to use him. Bill, what were your comments to Drake uh, yesterday when you went over the, the helicopter dive for the end? <laughs> you know, uh, I saw his mom after walking out to the parking lot. There weren't many people here left. And mom and dad were out there, you know, and I just said, hey, what'd you think? And, you know, uh, right away, I know she was thinking about that play, right? Because moms were thinking about, you know, caring for your son. I have to be honest and say, when you get that close to the goal line, as long as we're securing the football, I, I appreciate any effort to get in the end zone. So that's the competitiveness that Drake has. You know, that's just who he is. And I, I can't ever see him getting close to the first down or getting close to the, the end zone and not getting a great athletic effort to try and get in. I can't see him, you know, even the draw that he took down the right sideline, you know, he's been direct, let's, let's get out of bounds. He took two hits on the sideline for an extra two yards and it's not necessary. Down on the goal line, we're, we're, we're trying to get in, we're trying to get seven. And uh, so I appreciate it. I just want to make sure when you elevate and get up in the air, the ball tends to work away from your body. So, you know, it's, it's Javante Williams. You know, he got up in the air on a play against Duke a few years back and the ball came out because it's not a natural thing that you do and where you're maintaining the ball position against your body, it's hard to do. Um, but that's, that's straight being competitive. I appreciate it. I think our team appreciates it. And as long as we're taking care of the football, I'm good with it. I wouldn't want to see that out at the 40 yard line. Hey, can you give us a sense of, of how much of the package uh, Marion Hampton has right now? Is it, did he do what he did off of, like, you know, very limited? Uh, no, I, I'm smiling because between Coach Brown and Coach Porter and myself, we've had numerous conversations about O'Marion Hampton uh, having a package last week in the game because he's a freshman and uh, he, he didn't start the game. Uh, we, we got him in as the game started getting into rhythm a little bit. But this package soon became we're, we're playing O'Marion all the time, right? So it was going to be, hey, let's protect him and, and let's see how he does and let's get him the ball. And, Let's get him some protection. Let's get him a look at a throw, you know, just to see how he responds to all this stuff. And once he started playing, and once he started executing, and once he started producing, which is probably the <coughs> the key the key word there, uh, that kind of went out the window for me in my mind. 
and I ran the offense with him. You know, and, and he did a good job mentally of, of being in position and, and, and executing what he needed to execute. And I thought he ran the ball well. I don't think that guy's going to get better as, uh, as time goes on. He, he reminded me of year one Javante Williams for us when Javante used to break out in the open field and didn't have the, the moves, didn't do as good at the point of attack against a second or third level defender. And then Javante comes back a year later and, you know, he has the most missed tackles in the country in college. And I think he led the NFL on that last year. So I'm hoping that uh, Omarion will develop that same thing. And so that's something I know Coach Porter is talking to him about right now is having a little bit of an understanding and a repertoire once we beat the line of scrimmage about managing the next guy that addresses him in the run game. Where is Omarion with respect to the non-running things that he used to do? Uh, better, you know, it's, it, what, what's easiest for a running back? To know how to take a hand off and run the football. So that's what comes naturally. Um, but he catches the ball very well, truthfully. Um, we have uh, utmost confidence in throwing the football to him, as we do most of the backs. And, um, you know, the protection is probably the longest uh, learning curve for any running back in most offenses, and that's true here. But we're to a point now where that's not a concern for Omar, and it's just uh, we, wanted to, we wanted to try to make sure we got him enough reps in practice so we felt as confident about him in pass protection as we do throwing in the football and, and handing the ball off in the run game. You kind of touched on that, but how much can the depth chart change after one game, not just running back, wide receiver, offensive line? Like, how much do you put stock in what they did in that game and how that changed the depth chart? Well, I, I would say there's a, there's a lot of weight put on how they actually execute in an actual game. It's so different from our scrimmages, which were very competitive, and those are obviously very different than practices. So. In-game performance and production to me carries a lot of weight, and I don't know how much that's going to drastically change the depth chart. Um, I think where we are, Ross, truthfully, it's not about the who's first or who's second or who's third or who's in the rotation and who's not. It's more about trying to develop anybody that we think is within reach of helping us or contributing to the win on second. <clears throat> because we really want to get, you know, I think we played 18 guys in their regular rhythm of the offense on Saturday. And we'd like to get 18 to 22 on the field every week. So it's always looking at, okay, this guy is in the rotation, but he's the weak link. Let's, what can we do to get him better? So that we're just taking the field with a stronger 18 or 20 players every week. And I think the depth chart here is more, if, if you're on the blue team, you're playing on Saturday, and how you produce when you're out there really dictates how long we're going to leave you out there. And then the only other thing that would make that change is the fatigue effect. Like Josh Downs can go all game for the most part. De'Ami Brown was special that way. Great endurance. He could go all game. Those two guys only come out when they take themselves out. Right? Right now we're in a rotation to keep the backs fresh. Coach Lilly did a great job of keeping all three, all three tight ends in the rotation. All three had catches. All three had big plays. All three did nice things in the run game because all three were fresh throughout the whole, the whole game. And that's that's why the depth is so important, particularly when you're in a tempo offense like ours. Bill, from what you've seen uh, so far, what has stood out to you about Pat's defense just looking off them? You know, it, it hasn't changed. I'm going to say a lot of the things I'm sure. It's not like I went back and looked at our press conference against App State in 2019. But, you know, you've always, I've always known about their program. I've known a lot of people that have coached there. I've known people who have played there. Um, Typically, they are extremely well coached, and that's no different this year. Um, they know their scheme. They're not overly multiple, but they do enough that it creates problems for you. And what they do complements each other. But I, I just think they're incredibly well coached, and they, they play well together, and they play hard, and they play physical. Uh, and they force you to stay focused the entire game, because if you sleep on a play, or you have a mental lapse on a play, or you're not at your best physically on a play, then you're going you're gonna to get deep. And so it's an every down focus, and it takes some discipline and some mistake-free mistake football, I think, to be able to get after App State offensively the way we would like to try and do so. How was the communication on the offensive line, and what did you like from Spencer Rollins play? So you mentioned communication and, and uh, Spencer Rollins. On the first play, the communication wasn't great. You know, we let an inside zone go right through our gap, and then after that, you know, he kind of settled down and did a good job. And he's, he's kind of a, just a, a competent, dependable, trustworthy mainstay. He's really physical. 
Um, and he plays the entire play. So we, we like, he is a high effort guy. Um, and he's really bright, obviously. And so we have a lot of confidence in him. And I, th I thought he had a good game. He did a good job. Coach Vignell was impressed with the game that he put in. We were wondering uh, how he would be from a, you know, a rep count standpoint. We get into an 8, 10, 12 play drive. Can he sustain that? Uh, because he didn't play in a tempo system. You know, at Harp. So he's got uh, a full August camp with the way we do things, but you just never know how that's going to transition on game day, and that really wasn't an issue. And I think after the uh, the opening play mistake, where he's a little behind on on his his assignment, everything else wound up playing out. Spencer's good. We trust him. I I thought our line play was a great continuity. Uh, communication was really good. Uh, I don't know that we had any any play at all in the game where uh, we had four guys doing one thing and one doing another, which is a nice change and it, it was a plus for us. And we didn't have uh, you know the pre-snap penalties. We had one where they said Corey moved the football, you know what I mean? And then we had a, a questionable holding call on Ed Montillas on the draw in the two-minute drill that I definitely didn't think was a holding penalty, but it is what it is, and that stuff all tends to. It tends to even out during the course of the game. But overall, for an opening day, for our young girl line, very happy with the communication and the continuity. Phil, when you're making some of the comparisons of what Javante went through and maybe hoping Omarion can make the, that progression in terms of making people miss stuff like that, do you talk to him about Javante specifically? Do you show him clips of Javante since, I don't know, maybe a similar body type or something like that? Is, that, is he a guy you pull up for him? So truth be told, when I watch Omar and run, and I kind of see, you know, how he does things because he has the same blend of speed and strength, it just reminds me of Javante. So it's also half wishful thinking that I bring up Omar and Javante in the same sense because you hope that um, you know he elevates to that level. But uh, to answer your question, I would say it's on my my to do list today to try and get in touch with Javante today. I just want, and I have had this conversation with he, with he and Michael before about what they did in the off season because the two of them came back so much better in the weaker areas that they had. Javante was second level point of attack and you know Michael needed to get stronger and more durable, more explosive. And the two of them came back so much better in those areas. And they trained together, so I know that helped. And I'm just, I am very curious as to what Javante did to improve the second level stuff because I'd like to get that feedback and, and maybe share it with Omarion or have Javante call Omarion so that they can talk about it. And I also know Coach Porter, uh, that's going to be an emphasis for him with Omarion this week, as it would be with all of our other guys. All right, man. Thank you. Thank you. Coach. Coach. See you